And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most out of control ways possible. I am your one and only monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from the Heretic Whispers, and the, cre the creator of the audio, se the Star Trek-based audio series Chronicle, the uh, one, the one and only David McDowell. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. Mm -hmm. Small correction: my full name is David McDowell Blue, like the color. Like the color, or this, or the song that is, or the song that is used to torture people. Uh, aren't they the same? Yes. <laughs> I could also make a joke about Blue Man Group, and I'm pretty sure you've heard all of them. Oh, probably. Yes. <laughs> uh, I just say, I just say that because I've because I've had a time honored tradition in bars of jukebox bombing. You know, take the most cool. annoying take the most annoying song you can find and put five dollars on that one song so it plays on loop. Ah. Uh, <laughs> um, in other words, you're evil. I uh, I am. Um, well, it's a low grade. Evil. I mean, it's not. It's not up there with you know invading countries. No. Uh, setting off bombs, but uh, it, you know, it's still it, it counts. I am. I am chaos. Ah. Uh, Have you been following Loki? Um. Not. Re not really. Um. After after and I have not watched anything Marvel related after Endgame because. I had the mindset of how can I miss you if you don't leave? Like I feel like I feel like after Endgame ha came and went, that's like okay, that's it. We need to t we need to take a break because where else are we going to take this? You'd be amazed, <laughs> but I'm not going to ask. But I'm not going to uh, go further into that. Rabbit hole. Yeah. Um. But the, but I'd like to open with the humble beginnings now. Obviously, obviously, the main thing I was introduced to, to you about was the was the um, Chronicle audio series, mm -hmm. which yeah. it, which is rooted in um, Star Trek. So, yes. What I'd what I'd like to ask first is how is how you first get introduced to Star Trek. Was it so, was it something that happened by accident? Was it something that a friend or a friend or of a friend of, um, introduced you to? How I don't did it remember. Come about? I don't remember the exact details, but I remember. Um, watching a commercial uh, for Star Trek mm -hmm. uh, announcing this brand new series that was coming on TV. And it sounded very interesting. And as mm -hmm. it turned out, my parents wanted to watch it as well. This was in 1966. Mm -hmm. So, and I liked it very much. And I was thrilled when it went into, uh, yeah, I, I hate it. I don't remember having an awareness of it being canceled. But I remember uh, being thrilled to find it in reruns. Yeah, I um, I ended because of the fact that I've somehow lucked into being a journalist. I ended up doing a bit of digging to figure out um what what were the factors in that um cancellation. Um, oh, I know a lot of the factors <laughs> now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been decades and decades. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't know at the time. Of course, I was a child. Yeah. The um, the. I think I think the I think if there's any lesson from everything that happened when it came to that when it came to the cancellation and the uh, and especially with what when it during that brief comeback with the third season it is network people are idiots. <laughs> I think that it's it's the it's it's very it's very much the application of Hanlon's razor. Never never assume malice. What can be explained by stupidity? Hmm. Well, I mean, it was a relatively mm -hmm. expensive show to put on, mm -hmm. and it wasn't uh, nurtured because I think the network really didn't know how to. It was a, ahead of its time in so many ways. Yeah. In some ways, it was controversial. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, but I mean, it had, but it certainly, uh, it certainly pressed a button. Uh, yeah. Answered so answered an audience mm -hmm. uh, or scratched an audience itch yeah. that maybe they didn't know they had. 
uh, and uh, that's how a franchise is often born. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is, it's easy to say, in hindsight, you fool, you fool, didn't you know what you had in store? Um, but in fact, well, they didn't. I mean, they were looking at the bottom line and trying to make out as much money as mm -hmm. they could. Um, and I mean, I mainly say, I mainly say that, in, I mainly say that in jest, and in, in some parts of it, it had, it had to do with um, how how much power the how much power the variety show act still had, because yes. it'd, be, it'd be about it'd be about um, I'd say I'd say the variety I'd say the variety show was st was still the do was still the dominant factor. I mean, <laughs> it wouldn't it wouldn't be until say seventy nine and. That th that that whole concept was pretty much killed because of all the bad decisions that NBC was making at the time. Mm -hmm. Um. But the but given that given that um, was it one thing that one thing that I'm curious about is get is the early is the early days of fandom mm -hmm. the early, the early days of fan groups um. I'm aware of the fanzine, the Menagerie, um, but when it came to the idea of gr of greater fandom, was that was that something that you um, that you were able to delve in? How did you how did you get into Fairly, that? Not or... really, not really. To mm -hmm. be honest, I mean, I um, this was long before the internet, so actually, mm -hmm. I, you know, if you didn't physically know some people who were into Star Trek as much as you know, you were, as I was, mm -hmm. um, or many of the other, you know, the things I really, really liked. There weren't that many people I knew who were into the same things mm -hmm. I was. Uh, I didn't know that many people who loved Lord of the Rings. I didn't know that many people who were so much into Star Trek until I was older. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I hardly could find anyone who liked Dark Shadows uh, for the longest time. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, it's one of the things when I look back on it. You know, some people complain about the internet, whereas frankly, when I was a child and teenager, I would have killed to have been able to reach out and find people who had similar interests as myself. Yeah. Um, and to this day, I have a several fistfuls of very good friends whom I've only met online. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's. I didn't even become aware of it until the book Star Trek Lives came out. Mm -hmm. uh, then I found that, uh, then I began to understand that fandom existed. But to be honest, I was in my 20s before I attended my first uh, science fiction convention. And uh, it was quite a few years before I attended another one, to be honest. Um, partially, be, largely for financial reasons. All right. uh, again, and the reason why you know the internet was so amazing. I mean, that really changed for me in the '90s because I was at that time living in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there was a major con that I could go to every year, yeah. and uh, that was BayCon, and uh, so I began to see you know see a lot of people who and meet a lot of people. Uh, also through LARPing, mm -hmm. who were into various and sundry fandoms, and uh, that was so much fun. Um, uh, the first con I ever attended, you, you you can't see me, but I have a goatee, and uh, I basically uh, rinsed my hair, mustache, and goatee black, dressed all in black, and went as the master from Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. And so half I was wandering through the dealer room, and I just literally turned and came nose to nose with someone who was dressed as the doctor, it was Tom Baker. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sadly don't have the photographs we took at that time any longer. I wish I still did. But so it to me, uh, becoming part of fandom really was through initially. You know, online groups like build Yahoo groups mm -hmm. and message boards, and uh, you know, and later it you know it expanded. You know, of course, 
later by the time you get to you know towards the end um, of TNG in the beginning of DS9, and then uh, further you start seeing these explode. The, the internet really began to explode, and it's, and I synthesize began to explode. Mm -hmm. It has been exploding exponentially out of the Big Bang ever since. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I remember I was close enough involved in fandom that as um, particularly Voyager ended, there was a lot of discussion about, well, what should the next Star Trek be? Mm -hmm. The way fans do. Fans always do that. And I actually had thought about it. I should explain my background is in theater, mm -hmm. and I actually am a playwright. Um, so I came up with an idea that I just mentioned. It says, well, I would like to, uh, this would be my idea. And, uh, approximately two-thirds of the people who I posted this to reacted with horrified uh, shock. Um, this uh, And... Uh, Argued that I that uh, I was being irresponsible and that was not Trek and <laughs> oh, things like that. Oh, those uh, kind of people, huh? Yes, uh, really coming down on me very, very hard. And uh, part of me was very disappointed. Another yeah. part of me was going, "Hmm, well, that stirred up a lot of interest. <laughs> Good on me." Uh, and I'll say that that basic idea is intrinsic to uh, the story of Chronicle. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had a few other ideas that I've talked over in various forums and things. And honestly, um, a couple of those ideas also became fused and became Chronicle. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose what ultimately led to Chronicle was the explosion, yeah, one of many, and of uh, fan films. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so fantastic. That was so wonderful. I can't do that. I'll never be able to afford that. Quite apart from the fact that I don't have the training uh, of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some people who do, and I know just enough about what they do to know that's a very uh, tech heavy, specific set of skills and knowledges that I do not possess. And I didn't see really any purpose in life in collecting that set. Mm -hmm. uh, but I realized after a very little while that I could do an audio series. And the budget, for one thing, would be just incredibly tiny. I mean, the costumes alone were so cheap. The special effects. <laughs> oh, my Lord. I mean, okay. I spent almost nothing on anything. The sets, the costumes. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. All it cost was, you know, calories <laughs> of effort. <laughs> if, if it counts, it counts. Yeah. But the whole point is none of it came out of my wallet. Well, mm -hmm. a little bit came out of my wallet, to be fair. Uh, I, I had this idea that the hero ship of Chronicle, the USS Witch of Endor, mm -hmm. Uh, a visionary class. This was, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is not of a spoiler. Um, Chronicle takes place in the year 2410. Um, and the hero ship, which is in the visionary class, uh, you know, the first three are uh, being sent off on their missions, are uh, a very special long range exploratory vessel mm -hmm. uh, basically that have you know there you know, it's been decades since uh, USS Voyager got back and basically they now have a working slipstream drive it won't last very long it takes its own an entire separate dedicated computer core uh, and they have to reset that core uh, which takes about 45 hours after every time they use uh, the slipstream drive, but it allows the ship to uh, cross um, huge amounts of space in relatively short periods of time. 
uh, in terms of the series, uh, this is aimed at exploring the Perseus arm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not generally brought up in Star Trek, but in fact, the galaxy is a series of spiral arms of stars. Uh, and it actually makes more sense to think of the galaxy in that terms than in quadrants. Mm -hmm. We are roughly in what might be, we are actually called in what's called the Orion Spur of the Sagittarius arm. I, in the mm -hmm. series, I didn't go into that. I just said we're in the Sagittarius arm. The next one out is the uh, Perseus arm. And uh, basically, we do the calculations for how fast warp 9.999999999 is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. It would take them, it would take such a vessel going at that speed all out, never slowing down, five years mm -hmm. across between the two arms. The visionary class can do it in three and a half weeks. So that's what the vision is. So uh, the reason I mention this is because I just fell in love with the idea of actually having a design representation of what the visionary class would look like. So I went on deviant.com uh, and uh, uh, found an, uh, a Star Trek artist uh, named uh, Kude Okai, I think was his name. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, in the, it's in the credits of the show. And um, he, basically he designed, you know, I paid him some money he designed, according to my general specifications, what the visionary class looks like. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, and it turned, and a few, uh, about a month or so ago, uh, there's a wonderful gentleman on Facebook uh, who does uh, renders. Mm -hmm. And in preparation uh, for the second season and for trailers and such, he, uh, I uh, paid him a small amount to create uh, this ship going into slipstream. And so uh, the series has not been uh, zero cost. It's cost about $100 over the course of three years, which is, I think, as budgets go, pretty damn impressive. Mm -hmm. And now one of the, um, one of the things you, one of the things you mentioned that I do that I do find fascinating is when you when you pitch the initial idea for for mm -hmm. this project, um, a bunch of people were say, a bunch of people were saying that it was not Trek. And while I no. and while I certainly <laughs> balk at that idea at that idea, what I am morbidly curious about is, did anyone give any specifics as to what as to what in their mind made it not Trek? Oh yeah. I'm, pre oh, I'm pretty yeah. sure there were some walls of text. <laughs> uh, the basic argument was, uh, and I'm going to, I want, I don't want to give away, I want to tease rather than spoil mm -hmm. the Chronicle, but essentially uh, it is this idea. Um, their argument is, was that the Prime Directive as presented in Next Generation onward is a perfect, infallible, ethical doctrine. And to question it goes against everything uh, Gene Roddenberry ever held deeply in his heart and is to spit on his grave. Oh, that Oh, that particular chestnut. Yes. Well, I would like to point out uh, the Prime Directive in the original series and the animated series made loads more sense. Yeah, that's that's one of those that's one of those things that even I, as a somewhat historian, always find always find kind of baffling. That I don't know when this happened, but sometime in the last fifty years, the idea of the idea of the Prime Directive went from a Good, a good idea that we should strive for, but obviously, obviously, things happen out. Things happen out in space, mm -hmm. to and there's nuance. There's extenuating factors. Yeah, things like that. 
to word of God, you can you cannot deviate from this at all. Anything any deviation from it is an affront no to the enti to the entire of the Federation and to Gene Roddenberry. I don't know when I, that. I know. I know when that happened. I know when that happened. When... It was during it was during TNG. That TN, TNG, uh, people making TNG, uh, at least initially. Well, actually, I would argue pretty much throughout. Um, I'd say first two seasons, especially. Mm, through, I, I'm going to say throughout. All right. Uh, we're not. Um, we're not interested in Star Wars, in Star Trek, sorry, as a fictional universe. They were interested in it only as uh, a specific genre slash franchise. These are the people producing it. And so they didn't treat uh, the you know, the world of Star Trek as uh, something to be thought out to any great degree. This got better after the second season. It never, never got good in yeah. TNG. They, uh, it's wildly inconsistent. Many of the things are absolutely ridiculous. The people writing it, I mean, the original series went out of its way to hire people uh, who had written science fiction, mm -hmm. uh, whereas TNG did not. And you can tell a lot of these people were incredibly uh, people writing this. I honestly, the second uh, I it never even occurred to them that if a computer, if you have a computer virus to reboot, this was some brand new, wild, wacky idea that nobody had ever had. And this was season one of TNG. Mm -hmm. I'm seriously wondering at this point, are, is the writer's room using typewriters at this point? Um, Instead of word processors? Well, I know it. Are I, they that primitive? <laughs> that, they, you know, that they don't understand that much about uh, a computer? It's, in, it's interesting that you bring up this, that you bring this kind of thing up because T, because, um, TNG onward is where is where um, a certain pet peeve of mine in science fiction really began to rear its ugly head, and that is technobabble. And yes, technobabble is I'm not sure about you, but technobabble for me personally is irksome for three reasons. The first is perpetuating this idea that technology is this kind of magic that us mere mortals cannot hope to understand. Yeah. Um. The second is that it is that it's um glor is that it's fluff, it's padding, it's the garn yes. it's the garnish on your dinner plate that you don't eat. And third is that to me it um it it, it is so far away from the idea of go of good television and good storytelling. Exactly. Because I will I will give TNG credit that according to what uh the, I read about the writers' room. Mm -hmm. That initially, uh, when it was using Technobabble, uh, they were just saying, okay, obviously the, the note would be, okay, this has to happen. Mm -hmm. So insert something that makes sense here. Uh, by the end of the series, it was, uh, there was no idea of what that Technobabble had to represent. It was about, well, let's make up a particle of the week and just say we're going to reverse uh, the polarity of uh, <laughs> the Omicron particles uh, that we've never heard of before mm -hmm. and we're here of again. And <laughs> yeah. But our absolute, it's, you know, this is a, it's it, in general, in general, but this is a, a serious problem that the writers of Star Trek, of all the Star Trek since, uh, the original series. The original series, they were trying. All the Star Trek TNG forward uh, tends not to do its science, but take its science very seriously. And sometimes I don't mind that too much because I, I, I buy the idea that for me, I can't understand the technology of Star Trek. 
I mean, I, I sometimes in groups I said, imagine going back to, to a very good college graduate in the year 1621, 400 years ago, mm -hmm. and trying to explain an MRI machine. Yeah, I, I don't think you could do that. Oh. In fact, but if you showed them an MRI machine, I think they very might well ask with complete sincerity when they're looking at the screen is, where are the man's thoughts? Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be perfectly understandable. So we're trying to look at, uh, you know, I can understand we're looking at, you know, technology 400 years from now. Okay, that's something I'm not going to understand. I'll under I, I will accept that. But at the same time, it's how you approach it. And it's right, when you're using nothing but technical babble in, in, uh, rather than using the established rules that have been established, trying to maintain some kind of consistency, it bothers me. I think it bothers you, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, I went on this rant to agree with you. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no worries. We, um, we are the monastery is a no holds barred kind of kind of podcast. So r rants, foul language, drinking, there is nothing that's uh, that is off the table because oh, we... like a real monastery. <laughs> well, the uh... I've studied I've studied so much medieval history. That's yeah. Not... Um, <laughs> every, so. You have no idea how many people get on me for the whole monks don't drink. I'm like, yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for they fuck, sell wine. For fuck's <laughs> sake, there's there's monasteries in Tibet that brew their own beer. The Trappist, yes. there's the whole thing with the Trappists in um, Belgium. <laughs> yeah. I. Th uh, it, mm, it's yeah. It's not true. It's simply not true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's that's <laughs> not one of the vows. And. It's not. It's not like. It's not like every mo every monastery for a given re a given religion is going to have the exact same set of vows. Yeah. There might be. Might be some. Might be some um, commonalities, but there's not. There's nothing that's. But um, the amount. It's also, of... the monastic life is not focusing usually on the, the details for details' sake. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful story Joseph Campbell once told about this huge international conference of different religious groups. And how, um, like, you know, basically the you know the Hindu priests and the Roman Catholic priests and uh, the rabbis and uh, the uh, Muslim uh, imams were having the hardest time talking to each other because they're coming from such fundamentally different places in terms of just narrowness of what is the right way. But mm -hmm. all the monks and nuns got along great. Mm -hmm. because they're just more about the core the essence mm -hmm. and uh, the form is just the form yeah. so but that's get the, the now we're straying into areas of religion which is another <laughs> area I tend to argue about yeah in terms, yeah that's the thing I my biggest disappointment about my, okay my favorite series are equally are tied the original series and ds9. My biggest disappointment with DS9 is always that we never learned pretty much anything about the Bajoran religion. Yeah, that is that is that is that is a very un, a very unfortunate thing. Chronicle mm -hmm. explores some of it. Mm -hmm. So there, that's another teaser. Uh, Just as, by the way, I'm also very proud that because um, this, this were part of the things I wanted to do. In mm -hmm. my, I'm going to make my own Star Trek. I'm, I have a wish list. Yeah. And one of them is, um, I don't think we know nearly enough about the Tellarites. Yeah, and given how given how prominent they've been over the years, you th you think that there would be more covering that? Yeah. So what I is one of the major senior officers on the USS Richard Endor is in fact a Tellarite. And the actor who plays him does a wonderful snort, I must say. <laughs> um, if I'm if I may pick your brain about about something since we're since we're talking about this kind this kind of setting building and setting consistency, which sure. is something that I'm big on. Um, 
throughout throughout your years with exper with experience when it comes to tr when it comes to Trek, did you ever delve into any of the um, tabletop um, adaptations, specifically the role playing game ones? No, honestly, uh, I kept I, I delved I dipped my toe into uh, role playing games in D and D, mm -hmm. not a D and D D and D was out there. And I just found it scream. I loved the idea. I absolutely loved the idea. I found it screamingly dull because it was all about graphs and uh, numbers and trying to memorize statistics and uh, in, you know, your statistics versus someone else's statistics. I said, who the fuck gives it? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. So I stopped. I did not get into role-playing games until the advent of the so-called storyteller system with yep. Vampire the Masquerade, mm -hmm. which is, uh, which is, you know, predicated on move it along. Mm -hmm. You know, just trying to do something as simple as possible and just move everything along. And that's what I tried to do to the best yep. of my knowledge. And I was a very good GM for that game. Mm -hmm. I even have written books for that game, and yep. they, you can buy them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but it's, um, but, uh, the other game that was even more that way. And I, well, I never found anyone to play it with, unfortunately, is, uh, uh, Diceless Amber. Oh, yes. <laughs> you, you're not, you're uh, not I the first. I love <laughs> Amber. Would love mm -hmm. to have played mm -hmm. this. Uh, but I just couldn't find anyone who wanted to. Yeah, so. um, even even from even from my perspective as somebody who's who's um forgotten who's forgotten more RPGs than 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 most people will learn. Um, diceless games as a whole are have always been a tough sell. Um, simply simply because of certain things that have been grandfathered in even for even for a long time, um, gamers. Yeah, so I think there's something viscerally uh, very attractive about rolling the dice. I'd s I mean, very attractive. I'd say I'd say there's I'd say there's a visceral interest in the element of risk. Period. Whether it's through dice, cards, or something else, because hmm. um, although although um, one one particular game that I've that I've um that I've in, that I've discussed that I've discussed in the past that certainly has some of the spirit of the of the old amber. In fact, there's two that I could think of that ha that have some of that spirit. Um. One of them is Everway, which recently came back, and the other one is kind of a spiritual successor to, Am to Amber, known as Lords of Gossamer and Shadow. Hmm. Um, I'm unfamiliar with either one, but then I'm not really into the RPG world. I, <laughs> it, 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 it is, it is my preach. One, um, one of the big reasons that I asked about the role playing entry when it comes to Star Trek. Is because is because of the interesting changes that changes that were made from um, from the Fossa era. Fossa was the, fir was okay, the first yeah. company that ha that had it, and um, they end up they ended up making some significant changes, especially regarding Klingons. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's an interesting. You can also you can almost call Fossa you know a separate timeline. It it more or less is, and yeah. And the thing is, every single one of these, it's you know, I I looked at it and said, okay, that's kind of cool, but it's entirely combat oriented, and that really wasn't what I loved about Star Trek. Mm -hmm. um, so, although I will say, if you're going to if you're going to deal with war in Star Trek, mm -hmm. I do think. Uh, DS9 and then Discovery did a nice job of actually trying to make it real. You know, to tell a story about war, it should not be about ooh, all the cool blowing up spaceships. Mm -hmm. It war is dangerous. Yeah, war is death. War is cruelty. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I like the fact that both of those did not pull their punch very much. Yeah. When it comes, I have some to, other issues about here and there, but yeah. I'm, when, too, right? when yeah. it comes to when it comes to D, when it comes to DS Nine and the whole and the whole depiction of war, there's always two episodes that's that stick in my mind for that kind of thing. Um, 
the f the first one is the siege of AR five five eight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the other one is in the pale moonlight. Yeah. Um, and t to a less to a lesser degree, inter arma let enem silent legis. And I know I butchered the Latin there. <laughs> That's um, fine. Um, which would have which would have been a third on that, but it's just but there's just a little bit too much going on in that one. Um, I was kind of interested in that uh, it's interesting because so much of DS9 was about the Dominion War, mm -hmm. and it pretty much ended immediately with the end of the Dominion War. Um, but throughout the series, particularly the first half, there was a lot of uh, dealing with the aftermath of a war, mm -hmm. which was Bajor's war uh, rebellion against the Cardassians. And um, that's why, to this day, maybe my favorite episode of DS9, and it's certainly one of my favorite Trek episodes ever, was from the first season, and it was Duet. Mm-hmm about uh, the Cardassian war criminal and the whole echoing of it of just what a spectacularly horrific situation it was in every possible way. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, that also has a few echoes mm -hmm. in Chronicle. Um. Yeah, you had, you had mentioned you had mentioned that one of your one of your background experiences is as a playwright. Um, oh yeah. And because and and Chronicle as I, as I understand it is audio based. Each episode is around fifteen minutes. Um, Between nine and fifteen minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What um what are some of the hur what are some of the hurdles that you had to, that you had to deal with when it comes when it comes to the difference between writing for say a play and writing for say, for what amounts to an audio drama? Well, um, the one of the big things, and because I did want short episodes, uh, for the brutally simple reason that I've seen uh, web series often work very well with short episodes mm -hmm. is to tailor it so that there is uh, you have to have a cliffhanger at the end of every single episode um the other thing a few other things you have to concentrate on there are certain types of scenes that are virtually impossible they're very difficult to stage in an audio show mm -hmm. uh now in season two certain things uh, are a bit are a bit more common but in season one uh i've got some love scenes mm -hmm. how do you do a love scene you have nothing but sound uh and that's that was quite an interesting challenge because of course it's, it's a tendency particularly if you want it to even as i did to stray into the erotic then uh, you desperately wanted to avoid hearing uh, 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 things like that <laughs> yeah, because it's awful. It's mm -hmm. just awful. Um, but so instead, it's um, to express in dialogue and other and auditory clues things like, in essence, foreplay and afterplay, uh, like someone waking up. And having to get up and go to work, mm -hmm. and their partner said, and it says, yeah, and they accidentally wake their partner. So the conversation the two lovers have, mm -hmm. uh, or um, two people are talking, they're just like, and one of them starts uh, flirting. And it becomes, you know, if it becomes flirtatious, and how do you know it becomes physical? Uh, and how do you do that with just uh, lines and of course the whole point is the, there's a certain point where you, there's a line you don't cross which isn't too hard to figure out because it's something you probably wouldn't want to cross on stage at least I I, I would not feel comfortable doing so although I've seen it cross mm -hmm. but, and with great effect too but it, I would not feel comfortable so uh, you know that's something to maintain the other thing is combat um 
I'm a fencer. I would love to have a spear. I love the whole idea of having a full-on sword fight mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. But the problem is, how do you, you know, uh, how are you going to do a fight when all you have are sound cues? And I think it's uh, it, it comes down to the rhythm of the action. It, well, if it is a fight between individuals, uh, then any physical sound of the actual combat has to be very, very brief mm -hmm. because it's boring. It's just noise. Uh, but on the other hand, you could have it that, for example, if you're trying to say go down a corridor, and you know, you know, and you and your partner have a phaser, but you know there are some others down this corridor mm -hmm. who also have phasers and they're trying to take you out and therefore you know you can have worried steps of whisper saying wait there and then you both have to just jump out of the way and you hear phaser beams you know, and then you know phaser beams back and that might be fun that could be. uh when it comes to uh, uh battle between starships uh we haven't had that yet Oh dear, that maybe I shouldn't have said that. But <laughs> well, there will be in season two. Mm -hmm. In season two, it will be an issue, yep. and um, and that's a teaser. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, to my mind, uh, I was thinking of uh, thinking of it as if it were uh, a submarine movie. Yeah, yeah, that you're thinking about where is the enemy, and they're getting ready to fire. What can we do? Mm -hmm. Um. Especially if they're going to, you know, if their weapons have a capacity to take, you know, to to do partial damage through your shields and all this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's and ultimately, just uh, the big thing is uh, if the sh if listen, if you can somehow figure out when they're going to shoot, if you can avoid being hit, that's better. Mm -hmm. um, so, but uh, and even if you move only slightly, if it grazes your shield, it's a lot better than hitting. So that's how I am planning on writing that. But that's that that's a major difference. It's um, another thing is uh, if you have to describe something, to find an interesting way to describe what someone is looking at. Yeah. Um, now and you've you've lots um, of ways to do that. But... Yeah. Now you've effectively put up a full a full season of yes. Chronicle. Mm -hmm. Um, looking, but obviously hindsight is what it is, but yep. looking back at, at Chronicle, um, what, what would you say were some of the big, some of the biggest learning experiences that you had during its, um, during its development and after you put it out in the wild? Uh, how much time it takes. I must just effort it takes to, to edit all this together. Mm -hmm. And the, while I had some people who said they were interested in helping me edit the sound, in the end, they were not able to do so. So I ended up having to do all the sound editing myself. Um, that was one thing. Um, I learned a great deal about mixing sound and how to create uh, specific effects and the timing as I listened uh, in my headphones and listened to it. I found actually my uh, my scripts were too wordy. I ended up actually cutting uh, the whole lines. I said, well, I can do that. I just cut this because it's, it's better without that. Um, I also... Um, I learned a bit about... Uh, I learned quite a bit about trying to make, because the actors, the, act, the cast were pretty spread out. I mean, one of them's in New Zealand, another one's in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're all over. Uh, so it's not like they could be in the same studio. So it's a matter of that I asked everybody to do three takes of every scene. You know, record three different ways to do the scene, and I will edit them together. And I uh, accidentally found that uh, some people were mispronouncing certain words that I didn't expect them to. And I just, some, most of the time I had to go, eh, they're not a native English speaker. 
Um, except for one. One I said, oh no, that's too, no, 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 no. I have to ask her to redo that, that line. That, that's something, that was too extreme. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, Yeah, I, I, I did. Uh, I tried to do a great deal of um, publicity ahead of time. Uh, and I did achieve some, but I had to just learn to be patient. I mean, the fact of the matter is, uh, it's been over a year mm -hmm. since uh, Chronicle, uh, first season of Chronicle uh, was completely up on YouTube. Just with some pictures and then the voice, and uh, they're up. They're going in pure oral form now, uh, twice a week on a something called Podbean. Uh, in fact, uh, this morning, episode thirteen out of eighteen, mm -hmm. uh, called "What's Next," was posted. So there are five more episodes um, before we get to the uh, finale, and. Um, I think I should have, I realize I should have focused more on uh, audio uh, audience building. Uh, and I needed to be more patient about the publicity. Mm -hmm. I certainly did everything I could to try to develop it. I've got some very, very nice compliments and stuff. But I mean, there's so many things. I, I, I try to be philosophical about it because, mm -hmm. I mean, it lacks the visual bang of, of a. Uh, of what we come to expect with Star Trek. Star Trek is usually a visual medium. That's why uh, the so-called CBS guidelines don't apply at all to uh, audio series. Mm -hmm. I still obeyed a few of them because I thought they were legitimate and fair uh, and didn't really cost me anything. Um, and I tried to introduce, I did try to introduce a visual element. Like I said, uh, letting, I did create uh, images, and I had a Pinterest board, and I was showing people my images of what Star Fleet uniforms looked like in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and I even uh, tried to do portraits of the major characters that covered a quite large number of uh, races, actually. Although uh, no one yet mentions the fact that I don't have a single Klingon. I don't know if anyone's disappointed <laughs> or not. It's never come up. No one's ever mentioned it. Um, although several people did say that because it happened to premiere just about the same time Picard did, and somebody actually once asked me if I was in on the writers' meetings of Picard, I said, No, of course not. How could I possibly have done that? Quite apart from the scripts were all completed before they even announced Picard was going to be made. Mm -hmm. So and it happens that the series does have a lot of interesting parallels uh, to Picard in certain ways. Some, uh, one or two names that are disturbingly on, on the money uh, yeah. <laughs> about a couple of things that just, I was just kind of astonished about. But yeah, in some ways, it, it certainly uh, delved into the idea of what the Federation might be like later and in the wake of what we know happened. Uh, in the world of Star Trek after the Dominion War. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've answered your question, have I? I, be I believe you. I believe you. Ha I believe you have actually. Okay, cool. Um. Now, gif given given that you mentioned the whole pronunciation thing, um, dur as t as time passed, did you did you ever write a a bit a bit of a guide to to help to help steer that or I no? did from the very beginning. I just uh, I, I missed a whole bunch of things that I didn't realize people would mispronounce. Mm -hmm. um, part of it, and uh, in one case, this is uh, something that uh, is purely um, is not really a problem at all because whereas I had always heard a certain word pronounced a certain way. I've since been paying attention and found out that lots of people pronounce it a different way. Uh, so uh, it's not really a problem. It's just the issue, to my mind, you know, I was accepting in my mind, okay, these two characters are somewhat eccentric. They have a certain background. 
English is not their first language, so they might pronounce this word this way. Mm -hmm. And then I just started paying more attention. I said, no, actually, uh, it's only Americans who universally pronounce that word that way. So uh, I will just go, okay, fine, I'm going to let, let it go. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I did want to make a point of like uh, the uh, Tellerite officer. His name is Sarij. And I would make a point. People did pronounce it properly. Um, some people were uh, less, some of the actors who involved were not that involved in Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, uh, there was a question of how to pronounce certain uh, Vulcan names. Uh, sir, one person, I'm not going to say who, uh, thought, so this character's name is Tilar. Mm -hmm. so, no, it's Tolar. It's Tolar. Yeah. Um, uh, a few things like that. Um, other, you know, other than that, not, not much of a... Other thing, yeah. So I tried. Mm -hmm. I tried. It was not as thorough as evidently I needed it to be. Um, but it all worked out in the end. Um, now, obviously, you're ge you're gearing up for the for the um for the sec for the second season. Um, yeah, uh, I'm outlining and developing the ideas of how to do the second season. Um, it's frankly a lot fewer episodes. It's so it's going to be it's going to be less episodes than the first season. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it is it a case where each episode is is going to be longer or are there um other? They reasons? might be a tiny bit longer. They might be a tiny bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, the Thrall first season is in very much a mystery. Actually, it's a series of mysteries mm -hmm. that one slowly realizes they're all one. They're all entwined. It's all one big mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, and the two most obvious clues about that are that I used a tagline ever since I started advertising that the series was coming is tomorrow i'm sorry yesterday is waiting mm -hmm. and the other is why is the ship called why is the uh the, the hero ship is named which vendor why is the series called chronicle those are mm -hmm. two just interesting little mysteries and they actually absolutely dovetail into the themes and mysteries of the first season but by the end of the first season, most of the mysteries have been solved. It's dealing with the aftermath and the fact that the Federation is now in a not good situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, our heroes are right in the eye of the storm. And it's a matter of how is the Federation and Starfleet going to respond to an extraordinary situation in which they're not really guiltless. Mm -hmm. And now, when it now, um, I know that I know that the that when it comes to development of of this of a series of a series like this, um, I remember t I remember speaking with somebody who had who had done. TV production at one at one point, and he mentioned the importance of having what he called a series bible. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that is that? Do you have something similar oh, yeah. to that for Chronicle? Oh yes, and I sent it to everyone and cast. Yes. Yeah. Um, would it be correct of me to say that within that within that on your case, it's it contains everything to make sure that um, that that things are as consistent as possible. Yes. I I kind I kind of I kind of fig I kind of figured that that that, that was going to be the case since mm -hmm. you meant given how you mentioned that that um, internal consistency is a big deal for you. Yes. Um. Now, with with that with that in mind, do you have do you have a do you have a release window that you that you're shooting for when it comes to the second season? I would like to say the end of 2022, 
through, I think early 2023 is more likely. All right, and that's good. And I, I haven't read, I haven't written the episodes. Everyone has to record, I have to finish it, I have to double check everyone's available. Those who are no longer available have to be recast. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I have to have everybody record their parts. And then I have to put everything together. Mm -hmm. And that's a long process in itself. I mean, I got to the point where I could, if I had all the pieces and I could sit down and just work flat out, I could finish putting together an episode in a day. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of work. It usually was spread out over maybe three days, sometimes four, mm -hmm. because it was easier to do a scene than the whole episode. Oh, and I, but I'll I'll sort. I realize it's go, I realize it's going to take a bit, but as the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. <laughs> so, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how that um mm -hmm. how that develops. Um, Me too. Especially since um anything involving the use of time in in um fi in fiction period, not just science fiction, is mm -hmm. wrought with my is wrought with Tra with traps, minefields, and worse. I will say, the series does not deal with time. All right, I can... Just, <laughs> just to say that, just to note that. Yeah, it's just, it's not there. Yeah, it's it's one of it's one of the it's one of those things I think is important to note because um, as I as I said as I said whenever when that um. Whenever, because of years of pop of pop culture grandfathering it in, there are certain assumptions that people have any any time. Um, well, certain... yeah, it also gets into certain areas of canon mm -hmm. and just what is canon. And mm -hmm. of course, anyone who really pays attention, uh, no Star Trek series is even completely self consistent. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a matter of having to make certain decisions and just we're going to go with this. Um. Uh, and one was, for example, yes, the supernova, the nova did happen mm -hmm. in the Romulan Star Empire. Yep. And then I decided what happened as a result. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another thing that I decided because I thought it would be fun is, and this is not canon in the series or films, but it was mentioned, it's mentioned in some of the novels, is Andorians have four genders. Um, but uh, it, I also tried to work out how that would work, and one of the things I absolutely decided was they do not need all four in order to procreate. Maybe once they did, they don't anymore. These folks have built starships. They have the medical technology to have kids any, any way they want. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, um, I made the peremptory decision that it would be possible for someone to have the a, a, a child of a Romulan and a Vulcan, a Romulan and a human, mm -hmm. and that that offspring might look human. Uh, but their internal, their innards are quite, uh, quite a, a jumble. Which uh, that certainly makes sense. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a particularly common thing, but it does happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know, the fact is, you know, just as uh, in point of fact, if you have an African American and uh, uh, a European, some of European descent, have a child, it's entirely possible that the child may look very pale. Depend because it depends on the ancestors of mm -hmm. the African American. Who almost certainly has some European. At this point, we're all just being put. But it's, um, yeah, one of the characters, there is one of the central characters, it, it comes out very quickly. His uh, mother is Ron, mm -hmm. and um, his father is in Starfleet. He is in Starfleet. He himself does not look anything other than human, but yes, his biochemistry is, uh, is much more, his biochemistry would more resemble Spock. Uh, than a normal human would. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, it's it's something. It's like you're having to decide. Oh, check okay, how okay, how fast is the slipstream? Um, there is this. Uh, there is a, a presumption that was made in DS9 and Voyager, uh, although mostly in DS9, that uh, the majority of the Alpha Quadrant has been explored. And I thought that was absolutely absurd, simply because I know how many stars, uh, you know, are supposed to be in this galaxy, and you just, you know, and you just wait, wait, because uh, at a minimum there are a hundred billion stars. So that means each quadrant should have twenty-five billion stars in it, mm -hmm. and uh, assume for a moment that the Federation, the Klingon Empire, the Cardassians, the Ferengi, the Romulans, every even we've heard about in the Alpha Quadrant, uh, controls 25,000 star systems. And I can think that's a ridiculous overestimation for most of them. You've still barely scratched the surface. I don't think you've even gotten to 1% of the stars in what we would call the Alpha Quadrant. So I'm just thinking in terms of like the spiral arms. And mm -hmm. uh, I also have a certain assumption about, um, yeah, I made a bunch of, I had to make a whole series of assumptions about what my canon would be. Um, and I, uh, like, uh, what is the status of AI? And although it, it's barely touched upon, but I and the people involved, uh, you know, cast uh, discussed this, and one of the ideas we sort of came up with is making a functional AI is so tricky that, uh, like, it, ten percent of the time it works, the other ninety percent of the time it doesn't. It fails for some reason. Uh, mm -hmm. It may cascade into failure. Uh, the AI mo might spiral into massive schizophrenia. Uh, it just doesn't work very often. So you can get lower grade AIs, uh, you know, in terms of holograms or androids, if you want. There's a hologram character who shows up eventually in uh, Chronicle, mm -hmm. but this character doesn't have free will. This person, this is not a person, and they are very explicit about that. Because I am, I am not, I am not sentient. I am just programmed to imitate the sentience. Yeah. Um, and it's made very clear that there, this is the, the software is designed in such a way that can't be changed, thereby avoiding certain, the whole issue, just avoiding the issue because it would be this whole other thing, which, of course, it did become in Picard, and mm -hmm. I avoided that altogether. Um, so, yeah, things like that. Uh, I made a decision what happened to Section 31 in the wake of the Dominion War. Mm -hmm. um, and what was this? We don't really know that much about Section 31. So I made some decisions about what it's really like. Um, you know, the internal uh, uh, ways and means. So yeah, I had to, I made all these decisions as part of the basic background. Some of it barely touches the story at all, and um, others are kind of crucial. And others mm -hmm. will deal much much more in the upcoming season. Yeah, and I like I said I will I will certainly be looking forward to to it. Mm -hmm. um, but with all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones and technical difficulties <laughs> to come all the way up to come all the way up to the temple. Um, I think technology would work uh, much like with v much like with my VHS player when I was growing up. I think technology would be a lot more reliable if I could kick it. <laughs> um, I had, when I was going to college, when we got got word processors we actually had a, a journalism student who uh hit the word processors uh and you know someone the advisor kind of said you know ian that's a machine you're supposed to, it can't adapt to you you have to adapt to it 
prove you can. Prove you're smarter than a bunch of wires. So, but yeah, and because, yeah, but of course, that's different with mm -hmm. a VCR or uh, any some other things that are mechanical where you just might shake something loose. Yeah. You know, if you know exactly where to do it, you can mm -hmm. do that. Um, so, yeah, but I will go off on things like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. But if there are any other questions mm -hmm. you have about uh, Chronicle or uh, the process or what, um, uh, would you like some teasers about season two? Yeah, let, let's throw let's throw in a, let's throw in a bit of let's throw in a bit of fe uh, a bit of um fe a bit of feelers. Those, those are all those are always fun here. <laughs> okay. Do you have questions or just want me to offer things? I'd I'd like I'd like you to I'd like you to throw I'd like you to throw a bone so I can so I can watch people okay. um speculate. <laughs> All right. Um, in the first season, it's pretty clear the Perseus arm is in some ways quite different from the Sagittarius arm, mm -hmm. and um, that becomes real clear soon after they arrive. Uh, we are there is a major polity that is dominant in the Perseus arm far more so than uh, really the Federation is in the Sagittarius arm. And we're going to meet them, and they are unlike anybody the Federation has ever met before, at least in terms of any established canon. Mm -hmm. um, the... Uh, there are two. There are two major love stories in the series, and they are both in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, I know how one of them is going to end. I'm not quite sure how the other is. We will be meeting some new characters, and at least one very minor character is going to become quite important. Mm -hmm. uh, so will uh, the Tellerite officer's love life. Or more accurately, his romantic history actually will have an impact on the grand story. <laughs> well, I, I, that's one of my favorite mm -hmm. teasers to throw in there. Um, uh, the um, said we will find out about several other races that are in the Perseus arm. Mm -hmm. Mostly, we're going to deal with one in particular, but we're going to find out about um, uh, several. One of which is, you know, how you know when you think of Cations are basically cat people, mm -hmm. and uh, Tellarites are pig people. Uh, there is a race that is in Perseus' arm that is essentially owl people. Yeah, I'm not saying they're a major. You know, they're there. They're, they're there. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, let's see. Um, anything else that would be... Um, be a nice teaser. Um, I'm not revealing uh, if she survived yet. All right. Um, but le like I like I said, um, I do want I do want to get once again I do want to give my thanks for being so patient with me set, setting this particular adventure up. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to this whether it's to discuss the various entries throughout Star Wars or even even some of the books, or ju or just to um or just to la just to laugh at the Saratoga constantly getting screwed over. <laughs> the door the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> uh yeah i'm perfectly happy to come back mm -hmm. anytime. and of course anytime you anytime and of course um a sincere thanks goes out to everyone listening who took the time out of their schedule to come visit the temple and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then...
Go ahead. Look, I was going to mention something because I'm just because I'm in theater. Uh, mm. we're, we self-publicize. It's in our blood. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I just I had a play that was recently produced and it's now available on Amazon or for production. Mm -hmm. It is called The Wings of Dracula. <laughs> and it is an adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel, but in some ways a very radical one. All right. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> I, I do appreciate that. But until then... Until then. <laughs> on, be on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your monk, and stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>